Repentance. That's one of the most important things that we're learning about as we study the book of Job. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus as we set out for Job chapter 26, verse 7. And as you find your seat and get comfortable, let's hear from a couple of our fellow passengers who have left messages on our phone line. First, it's Muriel in California. My name is Muriel Thompson. I live in Sunnyvale, California. I hear through the Bible on KFAX. I listen every morning, and I enjoy it, and none of Saturdays, too. I always wanted to send a letter uh, to through the Bible, but I never seemed to be able to do it. And so when this came, this time I was reading uh, the information about the 50 years, and when it came around, I thought, wow, I've been listening to Through the Bible for 50 of my 97 years. It has been a blessing to me and an encouragement to hear the sermons that uh, enlightened and brought me light, joy, and hope, and also to be able to pray for people around the world so that they may find the Savior. So I've given many Bibles to my family members and to friends, and I always put a, write something in the front of the Bible that uh, Dr. McKee said once years and years ago, read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. And I had said it so many times, and people thought that it was my thought, so I had to tell them, no, I heard it on Dr. McGee's program. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, being able to share this ministry for 50 out of 50 of my 97 years. This is Muriel Thompson. Well, thanks for contacting us, Muriel. We love to hear how you've been sharing God's Word with others. What a joy to have you aboard the Bible bus each day. I'll be sure to save you a seat up here in the front with me. Next, We've got Chloris from Maryville, Indiana. I started listening to Through the Bible by accident. I was trying to find a station with religious music and heard your lesson. I became so engrossed I couldn't stop. As an African American, I never dreamed I would be listening to a southern white voice teaching the scriptures. I get up at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday just to study with you. This program is truly a blessing to me. Well, thanks, Chloris. We love having you join us each morning. And what's your story? As we travel through God's Word, how is He changing and challenging you? Have you seen maybe a bit of yourself in Job? What did you learn about God's providence in our recent study of Esther? We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can leave a message on our Facebook page. Now let's pray as we set out for Job chapter 26. Heavenly Father, thank you for the important lessons that we're learning as we study your Word. Please conform us to your will and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Friends, we have now come to the last discourse of Job. And it's quite lengthy. Two of the men had already spoken three times. And they are attempting now to answer and apparently... Zophar did not answer this last time. Bildad's last answer, third one, was very weak, by the way, in the sense that it was very brief. He didn't have too much to say. And Zophar didn't answer because Job pauses here in this lengthy discourse when he gets down in chapter 29. It seems as if he waits there for a moment to see if Zophar doesn't want to answer, and Zophar doesn't. So Job continues on till he is through, and then another one there standing in the crowd there that day, member of the audience, why he picks up the discourse and carries on from then until God breaks in. And all during that time, there was a storm gathering on the horizon, 
And by the time you get to the end of Elihu's discourse, for that's the young man who broke in, well, the storm breaks upon the group, and they all run for cover. And actually, Job is left there. And in the storm, then God deals with Job personally. Now, we are coming actually in this discourse to some really basic material as far as life is concerned. Because this book reaches right down where we are. And I think that we can see that below and beneath the suffering this man went through, that there is a great lesson for him to learn. And that is my reason for saying that the book of Job, the main lesson is not suffering, showing how God's saints suffer and the purpose of it. Back of that is the great teaching of repentance. And repentance is largely for a child of God. Now, when a sinner comes to God, somebody says, isn't he to repent? Well, the Word of God says, Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He made no mention of repentance, but repentance is in that word believe. Because when you turn to Christ in faith, you turn away from something and that's sin. In the case of the Philippian jailer, it would be sin and idolatry. And that would be his repentance. But turning to Christ would be the important thing. But many a child of God today and many a lost sinner today is self-sufficient. And anyone that is self-sufficient needs to repent, as this book will reveal. Now, we've gone into that because we are trying to get at the mechanics here as we're drawing toward the end of the book. And now we are beginning to see that the three friends have failed to convince Job. Their ministry was one-sided. And instead of silencing Job, actually they led him forth into a new area of discussion which seemed almost boundless. You think in this section he's not going to quit talking. And he could say to them, you are the people and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you, and I'm not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? Well, the fact of the matter is, Job's proven he knows a few things, and he's really attempting to defend himself here. And that actually is not helping anything. It reveals that this discussion did not accomplish anything, although it revealed a great deal, as we shall see. Now, here in chapter 26, we have a marvelous view, as we saw last time when we got into it. We have a marvelous view of creation, and Job will come back to that in this discourse. We find here that out there in that ash heap, he was able to look at the stars at night, and apparently he'd spent time doing that. And he could say, he stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. What a tremendous view we have of God here as the creator. And Job knew him as a creator. Job knew him as a redeemer. But Job did not know him as a sustainer and one that loved him and one that would not let anything happen to him unless it would minister to him. Now we find, as we drop down, and I'm just going to hit the high points here in chapter 26, gone over most of it before. In verse 13, he says, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. As you look out yonder in space, God has garnished the heavens. And I'm of the opinion that He's calling attention here when he mentions the crooked serpent that he's speaking actually of a constellation out in the heavens. There's been some question about that, whether he's speaking of the serpent as we understand it here upon this earth. But what he's doing now is calling attention to the greatness of God as it is revealed out yonder in the heavens. Now, in chapter 27, he continues... And friends, he's going to continue for several chapters here. And I think that we are going to be able to get very well acquainted with Job now before he finishes this. He says in verse 1 of chapter 27, Moreover, Job continued 
his parable and said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lip shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Now, I'd like to give another translation of that, and I think it might be helpful in bringing out the meaning here. As God liveth, he says, who hath taken away my right, and the Almighty who hath embittered my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak unrighteousness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Now, what Job is making very clear here, that he's undaunted and he's determined. And Zophar hasn't answered, but he's going to keep talking, he says. And he says, I will never admit the charges that you three so-called friends have brought against me. To the contrary, he says, my righteousness I hold fast. Listen to him here. God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove mine integrity from me. He's stubborn, isn't he, now? We're beginning to see that all that the friends have done have caused this man to defend himself. And in defending himself here, why, there's no brokenness of spirit, no humility of mind here. And this man is actually making it look as if God is the one who's unrighteous, and he's all right. He says, I'll not remove mine integrity from me. But he's being rather foolhardy in this, because before it's over with, he'll be down in dust and ashes. He says, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long As I live, listen to that man. These friends have not led him to self-judgment. They've only ministered to a spirit of self-defense and self-vindication. Job's vindicating himself. Actually, God is not on the scene here. Now, I'll grant that many things they said were true things, And I'm of the opinion that these men had the best intentions. I don't think that they had the truth, although they said things that were true. They talked about experience and tradition and legality, but they never gave Job the truth. And not having done that, they built up the man's ego. And you see, again, let me repeat this, because this is important. They thought, that Job had sinned, and they were trying to make him bring it out. Well, Job had not committed some great sin, and Job knew they were wrong. And since they were wrong, he assumed he was right. That's where Job made his mistake. Because they are wrong doesn't make Job right at all. And this man should have been in the presence of God, where there'd be a brokenness of spirit. And That's what trouble will do for you. Someone has said it's like sun. Sun shining on ice will melt it. Maybe cold, but it'll melt it. And that's what trouble does for different people. Here is one, a broken spirit, you see, just melted in the presence of God. But not Job, my friend. He's hard now, and he's hard as nails, by the way. He says, "'My righteousness I hold fast, and I'll not let it go.'" My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. And that's the position and condition of a lot of church members today. They feel the same way. Now, it's not that they do not have the assurance of the salvation. That's wonderful to have that. But my friend, you can be a hard-boiled saint. And actually, it's not assurance of salvation you have, but you have a great big ego. And you feel like that you've got it made. Well, Job thought he had it made, and he's going to find out otherwise. Now, let's follow him down. Listen to him here, verse 7. Let mine enemy be as the wicked, and he that riseth up against me as the unrighteous. My, Job's putting everyone who disagrees with him over on the other side. They are his enemy, and they are wicked. 
and the unrighteous. I tell you, that's a dangerous position for any man to come to. And then he goes on to talk about the wicked here. What's going to happen to him? And Job gives a little lecture now. And all of his trouble, this man's going to give a lecture about the wicked. For he says, what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul, will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? I'll teach you by the hand of God that which is with the Almighty will I not conceal. And what Job is saying in this chapter is simply this, that the wicked may prosper, but God will eventually judge him. And may I say what he's saying is actually true. But that's not Job's problem. Verse 19, the rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. He openeth his eyes, and he's not. Well, he says it doesn't make any difference whether he's rich. If he's been a wicked man, why, his life will go out just like a candle blown out by a wind blowing through a window. And actually, the time will come when men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. Why, can you remember when literally millions saluted Mussolini? And there came a day when they actually walked across his dead body and that of his paramour when they were down in the mud, having been executed. Yes, the wicked are going to be judged. They're going to come to an end. There's no question about that. But that hasn't answered Job's problem at all. But he's full of words, and here he goes again. He's taken off in chapter 28. And friends, let's listen to him, because here is one of the most beautiful poems of creation that you will find anywhere. And he deals with things here that are absolutely wonderful. And if we were studying poetry, I'd spend a long time here. We're not studying poetry, but will you notice it? Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Iron is taken out of the earth and brass is molten out of the stone. He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection, the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. Now, he's talking about how God puts down silver and gold and iron and precious stones in the earth. Now, he says here, he setteth an end to darkness and the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. It's difficult to find these things. I personally do not think that man has found near the treasure that's really in this old earth that we live in today. I think this chapter makes it clear, and I think it also makes it clear that there are precious stones we know nothing about that have never yet been discovered that would be more valuable than the diamond or any other. Listen to this. The flood breaketh out from the inhabitant. Even the waters, forgotten of the foot, they are dried up. They are gone away from man. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread and under it is turned up as it were fire. In other words, not only does the earth turn up precious stones, but also it turns up grain, bread for us to eat. Now listen to this here. Verse 6, The stones of it are the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. There is a path which no fowl knoweth. Now, birds fly over these mountains. And they know where there's certain veins. They can't tell us, apparently, but they fly over it. And which the vulture's eye hath not seen, but down in the earth and in the mountains, there is a vein that even the fowls don't know anything about, and the vulture doesn't know about it. And verse 8, the lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. I say because of this, that there's a great deal in this earth of precious stones and of valuables and of riches and wealth. Man haven't even tapped it yet. They haven't even touched it. That's what I believe that this passage is making clear to us. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountain by the roots. That's the earthquake. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Now, Job says, all of this, valuable things are in the earth, 
Well, where are you going to get wisdom and understanding? In other words, he's telling his friends, they haven't found it. Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it's not with me. And very frankly, if I may again voice an opinion, I do not believe that all of this probing of the ocean's floor and a probing space and of going into every crevice in the earth is going to tell man anything relative to what real wisdom, real knowledge is. That is, as to the origin of the earth and how it came into existence. I don't think man's going to find it there at all. And he goes on to say, It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. We're paying billions of dollars to bring rocks back from the moon. And they're expensive rocks, by the way. But they're not telling man what he'd like to know, I'm sure. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx of the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. In other words, this wisdom that Job hoped that friends would bring to him is a wisdom that is actually beyond the understanding of man. And he goes on here to talk in verse 19, "...the topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold." And the Bureau of Standards just can't evaluate this at all. "...whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say..." We've heard the fame thereof with our ears. We've heard about it. We've had a rumor about it. But even death ought to tell us something. It ought to tell us there's something on the other side. And it ought to tell us that there's something we don't know. Man just stepped through the door of death, friends, and they're not able to communicate back at all. Houdini, when he died, the great magician, years ago, he left a code with his wife. And he said, I'll try to communicate with you. The dead can communicate with the living. And spiritualist after spiritualist came to Miss Houdini, said, I've heard from him. She said, give me the code. None of them ever came up with it, which simply means that you just don't get word back from over there. That ought to tell us that there's something we don't know today. Now he goes on and verse 26 is an interesting verse. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. And the interesting thing is that for years there were those that said that this was wrong, that anyone knows that you see the lightning and then you hear the thunder. And yet here it's the lightning of the thunder. But since then they found out that sound waves do not travel as fast as light waves. So that you see lightning, but you hear the thunder afterward. But actually, the thing happened. The lightning is the flash from the crash of the thunder that takes place. And this is accurate. And it's amazing how the writer of the book of Job knew all of that. And we now come to chapter 29. Now, next time, we'll be able to make actually a diagnosis of the case that Job has that he's suffering from. I think that we'll be able to get him in God's clinic next time and put the x-ray on him, and we'll find out that the problem that this man had, that actually his friends were not able to probe at all. And I can, I think, give you an indication. I think I've already done that. He's suffering actually from a bad case of perpendicular aetis. Now, that is a very bad disease. That's when the little pronoun I becomes so important, and that's all we talk about, I, I, I. In chapter 29, and I'd like to suggest you read this over and see, Job in chapter 29, there are 25 verses, and he uses the personal pronoun I, or me, 52 times. And you get the impression Job's talking about himself. He's really wrapped up in himself in this chapter here. That, my friend, 
was the big problem that Job had. Now we're going to see how it had affected his life. And it affects the life of human beings today. You know, to get all wrapped up in yourself. And someone says, when you're wrapped up in yourself, it makes a mighty small package. So next time, we'll be looking at that. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. For more great teaching by Dr. McGee, join us this weekend on the Sunday Sermon. To listen online or see if your station carries the Sunday Sermon, then you need to visit us at ttb.org. And be sure to join us on Monday as our fascinating study of Job continues right here on Through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.